it is on television go strictly from the script because I have a bad, bad habit of when I go off script, bad things happen. So um, when I was preparing these remarks, I was asked when I first met Fritz, I, and I can't really tell you when that was because um, in the 40 years of South Carolina politics in which I've been involved, there's never been a time when Fritz Hollings wasn't front and center, uh, whether it was presidential politics, gubernatorial politics, senatorial politics, uh, state house politics. Fritz was always involved uh, and helped every Democrat I know every time he was asked. He had a quick wit, a sharp tongue, but more importantly, someone with the courage of his convictions, unlike our current senior senator. Let me say that again. Someone with the courage of his convictions, unlike our current senior senator. Jamie Harrison will show that dramatically next fall, a year from now. Fritz Hollings was never afraid to tell a president of either party he was wrong, and he did so on more than one occasion. I can tell you that's true because I sat in a small room with Fritz Hollings and Bill Clinton when I innocent, innocently asked, what about this NAFTA deal? Oh, my God. Um, and they went at each other with facts and figures, cat and dog. Uh, but when they were done, they may have been disagreeable. Uh, disagree they may have disagreed, but they were never disagreeable. Fritz had an acid tongue when it came to making his point. And I could, f I could, I could spend this, the rest of the day recounting the stories about Fritz's wit um, and uh, recounting just you know a few things that happened in his nine successful statewide elections and six decades of service. However, in getting ready for this speech, I did a little research, and um, there's a lot of analogies between the times. Uh, 1970, he gave a speech to an honor society, which I pulled and read, and it's just amazing how prophetic and how uh, similar those times were to what we're living through now. Um, and that was at a, at a moment where students were leading the fight for civil rights and an end of the Civil War. America was in turmoil. America was fed up. And I remember that turmoil well because in February 1968, I met with some SC State students who, were, who had just witnessed uh, three of their own uh, shot and killed by highway patrolmen because they had the audacity to try to integrate an all-white bowling alley in downtown Orangeburg. In April of that same year, Dr. King was assassinated, and I walked from Ebenezer to Morehouse in a funeral cortege of a half a million people. And one of the people we saw was Bobby Kennedy, who just a few weeks later was gunned down in L.A. And on top of that, the, uh, the Democratic National Convention in August was a riot. So. I'm getting the eye. <laughs> so I want to set the stage, though. And what I want to point out is Fritz observed our a sense of national community and shared purpose had frayed and was being replaced by balkanized special interests. We are identifying not as Americans, but as hard hats or students or militants or women or members of the silent majority. So he is a senator. And let me, I want to quote a little bit from what he told these students. And I'm going, hey, Trav, I've just thrown away three pages. Um, in 19, by 1970, Fritz was troubled that the clamor of rhetoric was in, increasing decibel by decibel and risked silencing voices for reason. It is a challenge that rises again as we sit here today. He said, quote, we must quit playing politics and lead. The country stands in need of a clarion call, a summons to greatness. It was Paul in his first epistle to the Corinthians who said, quote, if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself for battle? We are not preparing, and the reason is the uncertain trumpet of our national leadership. The road ahead is by no means clear. Shall we continue down this clamorous road of drift and division, ensuring the collapse of all that's been built by patient toil and sweat, or can we get back on the road of the forgotten America? And he said the first thing we have to do is go to work just as we have to today. We've given up on politics too soon, he said. Like 100 years ago, the politics of hopes have given way to the politics of despair. This is Fritz. 
Too many of us are seeking change outside the political realm, outside all institutions that can make productive change. Our problems cannot be solved in the streets. A just society cannot be built on the ashes of burned buildings or beaten bodies. A just society, a just society cannot be built when so many of us sit home in front of TV cheering for our side as our adversaries receive their comeuppance. This is Fritz talking, not me. No problem confronts this country that cannot be solved within the system. We us all must do our part. So one last quote. Unless we realize, this is Fritz, unless we realize that every man and woman has hopes and dreams and grievances and fears, we will lack the spirit of community necessary to a united fight against our many problems. We need not only confidence in government, but confidence in each other. Wise leadership can encourage that dedication, but first we must find it in our will to make a national declaration of independence. Whatever decision we make, there's a new America around the corner. What kind of America that will that be? It is up to you and me to decide. Fritz Hollings, 1970, talking about what we confront today. Godspeed to Fritz, and God bless you. Thank you. Fritz Hollings never lost but one race in his entire 58 years of public service. When Fritz Hollings was 30 years old, he was eminently good looking and he had a personality that would just light up a room. Fritz has a, a tongue attached to a brain that's entwined in, in a combative spirit, which means that when you go head to head with Fritz Hollings, you lose yours. He's the kind of guy that you wanted in a political foxhole, just as he had spent time in the foxholes of World War II himself. But Senator Hollins was an officer in the Army. Uh, he was in North Africa and in uh, Europe. He was one of those American heroes that served in World War II, and he was part of that energetic group of young men that came back from the war and decided to stay home and make a difference where they came from. He was 36 years old when he was elected governor of South Carolina. As governor, he wrote the book on governing in the New South. We all have a mutual challenge, one mutual goal, and that is for South Carolina to provide the best opportunity for all its citizens. He literally grabbed the state by the scruff of its neck in the 50s and pushed us into the 20th century. His vision for tech schools as a way of training South Carolina workers was a new, bright, visionary idea. When I became governor, the problem was to get jobs for the people. Today, the task is to get people for the jobs. For this, we must be skilled. Part of Hollins' vision was the fact that the technical education system needed to be in place in order to make South Carolina attractive for uh, the recruitment of industry. This project that he started with our technical colleges and attraction of new, sophisticated, high-tech industry has changed the state dramatically. One of the principal difficulties we had then was that people were hungry. Children were hungry. Adults were hungry. They couldn't get jobs. They couldn't make enough money to buy sufficient food. Some 49,000 welfare families and only 19,000, as Dr. Ellis will tell you, participating in the food stamps. Through Senator Hollings' so-called poverty tour, he shocked people into action. It took leadership. It took guts to do that. It was not a popular thing to do. It's not a surprise at all that uh, we do have poverty, but uh, the housing conditions there are no less than shocking. I first became aware of uh, this uh, young uh, southern leader of uh, rather remarkable posture and uh, command bearing uh, when he stood up for Jack Kennedy, but even more so uh, as governor when the neighboring states of Alabama and Mississippi were bloody battlefields in the fight for civil rights. And Fritz Hollings made sure that his state of South Carolina moved forward uh, without bloodshed. Holland's uh, position was uh, that we had run out of courts uh, and that uh, 
uh, Clemson would be integrated and it would be done peacefully. Uh, and that set the tone for the entire state and it was accomplished peacefully. Fritz comes as close to that as almost anybody I know. Thank you. And now we'll have some brief remarks from um, leadership at the DNC. Um, first to the stage is Jason Ray from Wisconsin, who is secretary of the DNC. Welcome to the stage, Jason. Well, good morning, Democrats. I want to start by just saying a tremendous thank you to Chair Trav Robertson, Vice Chair Price, uh, your South Carolina DNC members in Carol Fowler, uh, former Chair Don Fowler, uh, Clay Middleton, uh, Gilda Cobb Hunter, uh, and of course, DNC Associate Chair Jamie Harrison. Let's give them all a round of applause for the work that they do. As was mentioned, my name is Jason Ray, and I'm honored to serve as the Secretary for the Democratic National Committee. I couldn't be more excited to be joining you all here in South Carolina today. I thought I'd start by sharing just a little bit about myself and my story. I'm originally from northern Wisconsin, and when I was 17 years old, I got elected as one of Wisconsin's two members to the Democratic National Committee, becoming the youngest person to ever serve on that body. In February of 2017, I was honored to be elected by party leaders from across the country to serve as our National Party Secretary. In that role, I'm committed to ensuring that our party maintains transparency, fairness, and openness as we get ready for the convention in Milwaukee in 2020. In the last two years, I'm proud of the work that the DNC has done to rebuild our party, to elect Democrats from the school board to the Senate. We know that in order to win next year, we need to be mobilizing and organizing each and every day in each and every zip code. That's the reason the DNC has invested in state parties, built a strong data and digital infrastructure, and why we helped launch Organizing Corps 2020 to make sure that we are training the next generation of field organizers today. If we want to ensure that we defeat Donald Trump next November, we have to all collectively get on the bandwagon today. While our wonderful candidates convey their message to the American people, we need to ensure that we are doing everything in our power to help build the infrastructure that we need to win. And that's exactly what the DNC is doing each and every day, but we need you to be part of it. Next November is just around the corner. And no matter which candidate you might be supporting today, next July, after our convention in Milwaukee, we need you to be part of the team that will help take back the White House and help elect Democrats all across this country. Will you join me on that fight to retake our country? Will you join me? On behalf of the DNC, I truly want to say thank you. Thank you for the work that you are doing each and every day. But most importantly, I want to say thank you for the work that you have yet to do. Our work is not finished, but it's with each and every one of you, with all of us rolling up our sleeves, knocking on doors, talking to voters, we are going to elect Democrats from the school board to the Senate and take back the White House next November. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Jason. And now we would like to introduce to you Ken Martin. He has a lot of hats. He's chair of the Association of State Democratic Committees. He's the vice chair of the Democratic National Committee and chair of the Minnesota Democratic Party. Ken, please welcome to the stage. Good morning, Democrats. Oh, come on. This is South Carolina. Get some energy. Good morning, Democrats. There we go. See, as he just mentioned, my name's Ken Martin. I'm the chair of the Minnesota Democratic Party and president of our state parties association. And I want to thank all of you. I want to thank you for all the work you've done to build this party, all the work you're going to do over the next 500 days to build this party. And I really want to thank you for sending Trav Robertson back to his position. He's one of the best state party chairs we have around the country. And some of you may not know this, he plays a huge role, a huge leadership role with our national party. He's a great partner of mine. And welcome back, Trav. Congratulations on your election. Now look, we've got 500 days left. 500 days left until this critical election. There's some people around this country who think that this election is going to be a walk in the park for, park for Democrats, that it's going to be easy to beat Donald Trump and the Republicans. I know that you in this room, all of you in this room don't believe that. All of you in this room are going to do the hard work of rolling up your sleeves and going out there and talking to voters and making sure they know what we stand for. But we've got 500 days left. 500 days left to defeat Donald Trump. 500 days left to send Lindsey Graham home and elect Jamie Harrison as the next senator. I want to ask you, over these next 500 days, I want to ask you to do one thing every single day. 500 things. Doesn't have to be big. Doesn't have to be small. Whatever you want to do. You want to wear a button to the grocery store. You want to talk to someone in the line at the, at the uh, church or, or at the post office. Just talk to someone every single day. Talk to them about why this election matters, why voting matters, why we nip, need them to lift up their voices and participate in their democracy. Because that's really what's on the ballot. Democracy's on the ballot. When you think about what's been happening in this country, and this attack on women, this attack on civil rights, this attack on voting rights, this attack on immigrants, our democracy is at stake, and we got to stand up and fight for it. Are you with me, Democrats? But let me tell you, let me tell you, I get a little dismayed because, you know, we're having this big family food fight, and I think we should be really feel blessed that we have 23 great candidates running. But I got to tell you, my mantra for 2020 is vote blue no matter who, right? Vote blue no matter who. But you see, there's some, there's some that let perfect be the enemy of good in our party. In 2016, we had 10% of Democrats who voted for Donald Trump. We had a tripling of the third party vote in 2016. We cannot afford to be divided. Now, don't confuse unity with unanimity, as our Chairman Perez says. We don't have to be, we, we can fight hard for whoever we want. Get behind your candidate. Support those candidates that share your values. But when the time comes in July of next year in Milwaukee, it is important, I would say it is critical for all of us to come together in unity, unity of purpose, unity of mind, unity of action, to help elect our Democratic nominee. Are you ready to do that, Democrats? All right, let's go do it. Thank you so much. And now a friend from way back, Mathoni Wambu Crawl, political director of the DNC. Mathoni. All right, good morning. It is energizing to be in the room full of folks who are going to defeat this president. It is energizing to be in this room full of folks who are going to help us flip the Senate. It is energizing to be in the room that is going to hold that House seat and keep our House majority. It is energizing to be in a room full of South Carolina Democrats that are going to win up and down the ballot. As our chairman says, we have 251 days until the South Carolina primary. I'm breaking it down from the 500. I'm putting the pressure on. 
It is our jobs to lay the groundwork for our next nominee, whomever that may be. It is our jobs to build the infrastructure that Democrats will need to win this big, ambitious agenda in 2020. And we know that at the DNC, it's our jobs to help lead that infrastructure building, and we're doing it. I'm going to share some quick things on what we've been doing. First three things I did when I came to the DNC. Hired our interfaith director. Hired our rural political director. Hired our labor political director. They're not going to divide us along these lines again. We know that it's our jobs to help manage a fair, inclusive, an accessible presidential nominating process, and we are putting together everything we can to do that. We are working closely with the South Carolina state parties and all of our state parties in creating some really ambitious and new processes. And so we are thrilled to be here to share with you that your DNC is up and running and we are ready for 2019 and 2020. We are going to continue to carry forward the 50 state strategy and we are preparing the baseline infrastructure in all of our states that Democrats need to win up and down the ballot. And so thank you for all that you are going to do in this fight. I would like to introduce somebody. Where is Johnny Cordero? Johnny was standing right here just a minute ago. So as you know, we have been about the business of passing our delegate selection plan. And part of that plan is creating an affirmative, affirmative action committee. And Johnny Cordero is chair of that committee. And I think he's left the room for a moment. So we'll hear from him uh, in just a second. Um, however, as we move forward into next year, we will begin the precinct reorganization of our county parties and our precincts, and that is the fundamental tenet by which we will choose delegates to the national convention. So what that means is we will have to reorganize our precincts, and part of that is making sure that we are as inclusive of all of our people in this state. And Johnny Cordero uh, has willingly taken the task of running our Affirmative Action Committee, but he also chairs uh, the South Carolina Democratic Party's Black Caucus. And at the end of the day, that is one of the most fundamental tenets of our delegate selection plan. And so with that, Johnny, are you in the house? He's not. Well, he was right there just a moment ago. Carol? Would you like to come up here just a moment and talk about the delegate selection plan? No. Okay. There's, there's nothing like being on the hook, is there? Johnny, there he is. Johnny Cordero, the chairman of the Affirmative Action Plan a committee for the delegate selection plan as he makes his way to the stage. Mr. Chairman. They tell me the worst thing to do is to start off a speech apologizing. I do apologize, ladies and gentlemen. Please forgive me for being late. I'm usually very punctual, but I was outside to turn to tend to something else, so just forgive me. Um, wow. Hello, Democrats. Hello. You know what we're fitting to do, right? We're getting ready to take 45 
out. And the success of that attempt begins in South Carolina and begins right here at this convention. I want to thank you all for being here, and I want to thank uh, Trev for the opportunity to speak to you. I don't get, often get to do this as unaccustomed as I am, you can apparently see, to public speaking, but I am glad to be here. In 1964, a courageous, visionary black woman said that she was sick and tired of being sick and tired. She said she was sick and tired of being sick and tired. It was that sentiment and her subsequent actions, along with the work of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, that made it possible for me to stand before you today as chairman of the Affirmative Action Committee and chairman of the Democratic Black Caucus of South Carolina. I am honored to be here. And I am only here because of your support. Today, my fellow caucus members and I honor Ms. Fannie Lou Hamer. With her image emblazoned on our t-shirts, we make sure that people understand the sacrifices that were made for us to be here today. Once again, for just a brief moment of recognition for the efforts, for the courage and for the vision of Fannie Lou Hamer. As chairman of the Affirmative Action Committee, I have the distinct honor of continuing her noble work to make our great party more diverse and to make sure that we put in the work for all, regardless of race, religion, gender, age, or sexual orientation. I can tell you today that my fellow Affirmative Action Committee members and I have made it our mission to ensure the 2020 Democratic delegation from South Carolina is to be the most diverse in our state's history. We will ensure that the South Carolina Democratic Party's Affirmative Action Plan is fully implemented as the process gets underway for the selection of delegates to represent our great state in the 2020 Democratic National Convention in Milwaukee. I take this responsibility seriously, very seriously. So much so that we will commit to finding financial assistance to help delegates who may need to defray the cost of travel to Milwaukee in 2020. That is also part of our responsibility. This responsibility and our commitment to our constituents has been made infinitely easier thanks to the support and assistance from our chairman, Trav Robertson. Let me tell you as a personal point of reference, let me tell you about Trav as quickly as I can. Every time I call, yeah, that's what he means, it's time for me to go off. But he asks only one question every time I call him. And he says, Mr. Chairman, what do you need? And each time I get his support and his assistance, genuinely and sincerely, that is your new chairman. One last thing for the record, and as a reminder to the candidates, there are 963, just one second, 960, this is very important, ladies and gentlemen. He gonna carry me off in a minute, and you know he's bigger than I am. I just wanna say this one last thing, we're going. We're, we're, on, a, we're on a tight schedule. As a reminder to the candidates, there are 963,000 registered African-American voters in South Carolina. We represent 60% of the Democratic electorate in this state. Of those, African-American females make up a large percentage and vote most often. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to send a diverse one to this city. Thank you so much for your time. I apologize for going over. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Cadero. Uh, we are on a strict schedule. The presidential candidates are here. And um, first up to today, welcome to the stage, 
the senator from California, Kamala Harris. Good to be in the Palmetto State. Thank you all. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I just want to start by thanking you, South Carolina Democrats, because y'all have been holding it down. You've been doing what needs to get done. And it ain't easy. You make it look easy, but I know it's not. And I know that for everyone here, this is personal to you. You dedicate time from your lives where you have so many other obligations, but you keep giving and giving and giving. And I know it is because we are all under this one roof together for one reason, which is that we love our country. We love our country, and we are prepared to fight for the best of who it is and who we are. And we all know this is an inflection moment. This is a moment in time that is requiring us each to look in a mirror and ask a question that question being, who are we? And I think with South Carolina Democrats, what we all know is we are better than this. And so this is a moment in time where we will fight for the best of our country. And I want to congratulate Trav on a, on a great convention and, um, and thank everybody. So listen, I mean, here's the thing. We know that as Democrats and as those who are leaders, um, who, who take it upon ourselves to do everything in our ability and power to lift folks up, to tap on our neighbor, neighbor, to tap on our, on our friend who may be sitting on the pew next to us, to tap on the shoulder of our coworkers and our family members. We know that part of the strength of who we are is not only the values that we hold, the principles by which we conduct ourselves, our faith, our vision for the future. Our strength is also that we know how to organize, that we know how to do the critical work that must be done every day to make sure that we get our message across and that we accomplish our goals because we also know that in order to fight for the best of who we are and to fight for our values and see them reflected in our elected leaders, we know we must elect the right people. We know elections matter. We know who holds those important positions will make decisions about our lives. And so we want to make sure that the people who are there are conducting themselves in a way that is about our interest and not their self-interest. And so I believe, as it relates to who we have as President of the United States, we need not only a leader of our country, but we need a leader of our party. We need somebody who, as President of the United States, understands the need to rebuild the party, who understands the need to give the resources and the support to the people who are on the ground every day doing the hard work. We can't just helicopter in here. We have to support the people who are on the ground, who know the community and do the work every day. And that's the kind of president I intend to be. And South Carolina, you have such a rich and deep history of fighters. You have the fighters who have always fought for the conscience and for the morals of our country, those great civil rights fighters. You have had fighters past and present. Just last week, we commemorated the four-year anniversary of the Emanuel Nine, recognizing those heroes and the sacrifice and the fact that still there is so much to fight for in our country. We look at the great heroes and the, the leaders who have come out of South Carolina, the Friendship Nine. We look at the Orangeburg protesters, and we know they believed in a nation. They believed in a nation of equality where everyone counted. They were deep of faith. They understood what can be unburdened by what has been, and it is upon their shoulders that we now stand, charged with the duty and the responsibility 
of understanding what can be and fighting to get there. That is our responsibility. And you know, I was raised in a family of civil rights fighters. I was raised in a community where we were taught, don't you hear no when they say it? Know where we are and know and see the vision and be deep of faith in knowing that you can see what maybe others can't see, but you can help them get there. You can help them get there, but it will take a lot of work. It will take a lot of work. So I stand before you as a candidate for President of the United States, prepared to do the work of helping our nation see what can be unburdened by what has been and see the vision of the future, respecting our past. I know that we have in this White House a president who says he wants to make America great again. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean he wants to take us back to before schools were integrated? Does that mean he wants to take us back before the Voting Rights Act was enacted? Does that mean he wants to take us back before the Civil Rights Act was enacted? Does he mean he wants to take us back before Roe v. Wade was enacted? Because we're not going back. We're not going back. We see a future. We see a future. And I'm going to tell you, not only am I a child of parents who were active in civil rights fighters and marchers, I also had a career as a prosecutor. So let me tell you a little bit about that. I know how to take on predators. I took on the big banks and won over $20 billion. I took on for-profit colleges and put them out of business. I took on oil companies who were polluting our environments. I took on transnational criminal organizations who were preying on women and children. I know how to get that job done. And I did it for the people, for the people. So let me tell you, we need somebody on our stage when it comes time for that general election who knows how to recognize a rap sheet when they see it and prosecute the case. So let's read that rap sheet, shall we? He asked black Americans, he said, what do you have to lose? Well, we know civil rights investigations are down, hate crimes are up. We had a lot to lose. Let's look at that rap sheet where he told working people that he would help them, but instead passed a tax bill benefiting the top 1% and the biggest corporations of this country. Said he would help the farmers, but passed what I call the Trump trade tax, Trump trade policy by tweet, and now we got farmers who have soybeans rotten in bins and auto workers who may be out of their job by the end of the year. Let's look at that rap sheet where he said he would give everyone health care, but he's still trying to rip care, health care away from folks and turn back the clock on Obamacare. Let's talk about looking at that rap sheet where he has embraced dictators like Kim Jong-un and Putin and taken their word over the word of the American intelligence community. Let's prosecute the case. Let's prosecute that case. And let's not turn back the clock. Let's start the next chapter, shall we? Let's start the next chapter. Let's turn the page. And here's what I see in that next chapter. I see us fighting for our America in what I call the 3 a.m. agenda, which means looking at writing that next chapter through the lens of what wakes us up in the middle of the night. What's on our minds? What do we need to deal with? So let's turn the page, South Carolina, and write that next chapter in a way that we take action. We take action on paying people equally for the work that they do, be they women, paying our teachers what they deserve in terms of paying them their value. Let's take action on getting $500 more a month to working families so they can get through the end of the month. Let's take action and make sure that if Congress doesn't have the courage to pass smart gun safety laws, then we will get the job done. Because I believe in an America, I believe in an America, an our America, where you only have to work one job to have a roof over your head and put food on the table. I believe in an America where teachers are paid their value. I believe in America where no politician tells a woman what to do with her body. I believe in an America where health care is a right and not a privilege for just those who can afford it. 
I believe in an America where children do not have to fear going to school for fear of a mass shooter. I believe in an America. I believe in an America where we have a president who understands the greatest strength and the greatest power any one individual can have is not to beat people down, but to lift them up. So I'm here to ask you for your support. Thank you, South Carolina. ready to come to this podium. Democrats, we have a little piece of South Carolina in the 1st District, don't we now? Good morning, good morning. The words that echo in my head are do the right thing, keep your word, even when it takes the skin off your nose. I remember those because those words were spoken to me by my dad, and he heard those from his dad. They're the words that I try to live by. And that's why when running for office, I didn't make sweeping promises that would be impossible to keep. I promised I would make sure that there would never be any oil rigs off of our coast of South Carolina. I promised I would lower the cost of health care and prescription drugs. I promised to be an independent voice that wasn't bought and paid for by PACs or special interests or anyone, someone who's held accountable to the people. A voice that was accountable to the low country and the low country alone. And when I announced my intention to take on Congressman Sanford, folks thought I was crazy as hell. Donald Trump had just won the first district by 13 points and Sanford had won the previous election by over 20 points. And who was I? Just a construction attorney from Charleston who was fed up on the way things were going. On election night, when you all saw that video, 538 gave us a 9% chance of winning that night. Basically saying that we had a better chance of winning the lottery than winning that election. But at the time of that video, we found out that the people of the first district were just as fed up as I was. And they elected a Democrat for the first time in nearly 40 years. <laughs> South Carolina has been written off for far too long. We've been given up as dead. Well, not anymore. Our election was a lesson to every single D.C. Beltway pundit who said that our state could never turn blue. Frankly, I don't think there's a single part of this country where Democrats cannot compete, so long as we run the right candidates with the right message. You know why? It's because Democrats, we win on our values. We win on our ideas. We win with our hearts. Frankly, 
most folks just want someone who has their back. And that's why I promised I would always put low country over party and people over politics. I'd work with anyone to fulfill the promises I made to the people of the low country. And just look at what we've accomplished in the last six months. I promised my constituents I wouldn't say just no to offshore drilling, but I'd say hell no to offshore drilling. And we introduced a bipartisan bill that would ban offshore drilling that just passed out of the Natural Resources Committee and will be coming to the House floor for a vote this year. We passed the first pieces of gun safety legislation in nearly 25 years. Bipartisan, common sense gun safety measures. And we passed a bill that would close the Charleston loophole out of the House. And I got to tell you, standing on the floor alongside Majority Whip Clyburn, as we passed that bill to close the Charleston loophole, and Jennifer Pinckney was up in the gallery with her two beautiful daughters looking down on us while we passed that bill was one of the best moments I've had in my short tenure serving the 1st Congressional District. We, we, we got together and we passed H.R. 1 to take special interest out of the driver's seat and put people back behind the wheel. It was legislation that ends partisan gerrymandering, creates automatic voter registration, and kicks dark money out of our election system. We recognize that it's absolutely unacceptable that in South Carolina today, a same-sex couple could have gotten married this morning and be fired, evicted, or denied service later this afternoon. And the same thing is true for 29 other states. That's why we passed the Bipartisan Equality Act to prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity. We recognize that no one should be too poor to afford health care. No one should be forced into bankruptcy just because they can't afford their medical bills. And no one should have to ration insulin because it's too expensive. It's un-American. That's why we worked across the aisle to pass not three, four, six, or eight, but nine pieces of legislation that lowers the cost of health care, protects people with pre-existing conditions, and helps bring down the cost of prescription drugs. We told you we would do it in the House, and we have done it. And you know how we did that. It's because of you. You knocked on doors. You made phone calls. You sent text. You tweeted. And most of all, you voted. And it's important to remember, although they say 2019 is off year, we know there ain't no such thing as an off year. The work goes on. And it's important we remember what it is exactly that we're fighting for. For me personally, I know I've got a son at home right now that I'll be going home to shortly. 16 months old, and, and, and I miss him like crazy when I'm up in D.C. But I like to think that our country needs a steady hand on the wheel in this pivotal time in our nation's history, and that somehow I'm being a better father up there in D.C. at times than I would be back home because I'm looking out for his future and the future of your children and your grandchildren because that's what this is all about. I, I, I want to be able to, years down the road, when he's standing eye to eye with me, look him in the eye and, and say that I was there for him. I had his back. and I was looking out for him and his peers and the generations that follow. I want to tell them that I did the right thing, that I kept my word, even when it took the skin off my nose, 
that we kick dark money and special interests out of Washington, D.C., and now create a better future for him and other kids across the country. I want to tell him that I'm proof that if you play by the rules, if you keep your promises, if you treat every single person with the dignity and respect they deserve and show a little backbone when necessary, that anything is possible. And thanks to your support, I know I'm going to be able to do just that. In closing, I want to say one thing, and one thing only to the presidential candidates. Thank you for offering yourself for public service. Thank you for putting yourself out there, because we need it now more than ever. But remember, let's keep the infighting to a minimum and keep our eye on the prize. Thank you. Let's give the Congressman another round of applause. An interesting thing is, is that in this seat where the congressman serves, it was the first seat that the Republicans took from the Democrats in the last century. And he was the first Democrat to take it back from the Republicans in this century. I want to thank all of the speakers that have been here so far you all having a good time? We actually um, have um, a lot of um, speakers to come to you um, this afternoon. I want to thank um, uh, Ms. Helen McFadden over here, who has been our parliamentarian for how long, Helen? Too long. Too long. She keeps us in order. And I guess it's about 35 years now? 35 years. Are we ready? OK. Now, moving on for what you come here for, our next presidential candidate. Please welcome the senator from Massachusetts, Senator Elizabeth Warren. did I think I would be standing on a stage like this. I had one dream in my life for what I wanted to do when I grew up, and that is to be a public school teacher. Can we hear it for America's public school teachers? Now, it was a pretty rugged path for me. My daddy ended up as a janitor. We didn't have any money for it. I finally made it off to college, then I dropped out at 19 and got married, found a commuter college that cost $50 a semester, scratched my way back, made my four-year diploma, and became a special needs teacher. I've lived my dream job. And in case you don't know this about teachers, let me just tell you, teachers understand the worth of every single human being. Teachers invest in the future, and teachers never give up. I come to you today filled with optimism. Optimism because I've been around South Carolina for the last six months. I've been around this country for the last six months. And people across this nation understand it is time for big structural change in America. The time for small ideas is over. 
So here's how I see it. It's time for big plans, and yeah, I got some big plans. Let's start with a wealth tax. Two cents on the top one-tenth of one percent. The biggest fortunes in this country, we ask them to pitch in two cents, and here's what we can buy for it. Universal child care for every one of our babies aged zero to five. Universal pre-K for every three-year-old and four-year-old in this country. Raise the wages of every preschool teacher and child care worker in America. Provide universal tuition-free technical school, community college, and four-year college for every kid who wants to go. $50 billion investment in our historically black colleges and universities. Let's level the playing field. And also for that same two cents, we can cancel student loan debt for 95% of the folks who've got it. And that last plan took a big step toward becoming a reality this past week when your Congressman Clyburn and I introduced that bill in the House and the Senate together. You know what all those big plans are about? They're about a fundamental question. Who does government work for? Is government just going to work for a thinner and thinner slice at the top? Well, I'm in this fight because I believe we can make government work for everyone else. And I believe that when we get in the big fights, for the big ideas, that's when it is that we draw in Democrats and Republicans. That's when it is that we make it worthwhile for people to get in the fight. That's why we're here, to build a future, not just for those who are born into privilege, but to build a future for everyone. And that's what my campaign is all about. I've had more than 100 town halls. I've been to 20 states and Puerto Rico. I've done over 30,000 selfies. <laughs> but it hasn't been about spending my time with millionaires. It hasn't been about going behind closed doors. It's been about getting out and building a grassroots movement. Because come November 2020, we want to build Donald Trump. We need to build that grassroots movement starting right now. So if you think that that is how we build a campaign to win, if you think that is how we build the country of our best dreams, then join me. Go to ElizabethWarren.com, donate five bucks, volunteer an hour, pitch in, but most of all, be part of this fight. This is our chance in 2020, our chance to dream big, to fight hard, and to win. Thank you. Another round of applause for the senator. This morning, we have a, another one of the officers that is going to come before you for a special request with the tradition that we have here at the convention. I will bring back to the stage 
Our treasurer is Betsy George. Well, hey, y'all. Good to see you again. I bet you can't guess why I'm here. I'm actually going to introduce you to a gentleman who is just a real pillar of the South Carolina Democratic Party, a former chair of SCDP, a former chair of the Democratic National Committee, Dr. Don Fowler. Shh. Repeat after me. Listen, money, repeat after me, money, money is, is the, the mother's milk of politics. Okay, everybody repeat that. Money is the mother's milk of politics. Now, I want some mother's milk, and I want it from every one of you here. We've all heard all sorts of things about the evil of money and how Money corrupts politics, and it does. But the money that doesn't corrupt politics is the money that comes from people like you who are devoted to the Democratic Party, its issues, and the people of South Carolina. This money is good money, and it is the mother's milk of politics. All right, listen. Who's going to give me a pint of the mother's milk of politics? <laughs> and a pint is $5. Who? Who? All right. Who's going to give me two pints? And that's $10. Oh, that's good. How about a quart and $20? $20, that's wonderful. How about a big old gallon? That's $100, right? Good. In all seriousness, money is important in politics, and the best money in politics is the money comes that comes from people like you who are devoted to the issues and this, this institution. It is the kind of thing that will permit us to win the presidential race here in South Carolina next year. So please, please give and give generously. Thank you very much. And go, pass that hat. Your generosity today will help us, as you heard Trav mention, make a new home for the South Carolina Democratic Party's headquarters. Your contributions will help fund the Clyburn Fellowship Program that is training a new generation of leaders right here in South Carolina. Where are my fellows? Hey, there they are. Where's my third class? In the house. I see you, Isaac. <laughs> Your contributions are going to help us flip the South Carolina State Senate. Your contributions are going to help us put on the ground a field program that is going to flip this state blue in 2020. Now we've got a few minutes here. I want everybody to rise. I want everybody to rise and I want you to pay attention to giving that money, but I want everybody to sing Happy Days Are Here Again. All right? Can you sing? I can't. All right, let's go. Happy Days Are Here Again. Happy Days Are Here Again. Here Again. Alan St. John is here again. Happy days are here again. One more time. Happy days are here.
Wow, isn't that something? I come to the stage and the music stops. They told me not to dance. So I'd like for everyone now to sort of um, come back to order and um, maybe return to your seats if you can. I have a um, great responsibility that I have a pleasure of, and that's knowing who's going to come next. Are we ready? It is my pleasure to bring to the stage Pete Buttigieg, Mayor of South Bend, Indiana. Mayor Pete. Hello, South Carolina. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What a treat. All right, how about everything? Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you for what you do. To Chairman Robertson and the entire party, it is so good to be in a state that is home to institutions like Whip Clyburn, new arrivals like Congressman Cunningham, my fellow mayor, Steve Benjamin, and so many people at every level of government and activism who know even though there's a lot of 2020 types coming over these, these days, who know that it is time that we stop treating the presidency like it's the only office that matters and organize to win at every level of the ticket. I'm thankful to be with you. I'm with you after a challenging week back home. I've been off the campaign trail, helping my community move through a tragic shooting of a resident of our community by a police officer. It is as if one member of our family died at the hands of another. And even as an outside process works to determine what happened, we already know why such deep wounds are surfacing, why our whole community hurts. But I also want to tell you that my community is full of people who believe in safety and justice, we will heal and we will come stronger in the broken places. When a city is challenged, just as when a nation is challenged, the most important thing you can fall back on is your values. And I'm here to talk about the values that make us Democrats, because I am sick of the word values being talked about like it only belongs on one side of the aisle. Values like freedom and security and democracy are not conservative values, they are American values. And this is the year we break the Republican monopoly on talking about freedom. We're the ones who know that freedom is at stake if there is a veil of mistrust between community members and officers sworn to keep them safe. We know that you're not free if you don't have health care and you're afraid to start a small business. We know that freedom can only come by way of education, which is why we need a president who will, who will appoint a secretary of education who actually believes in public education. And we know that you're not free when your reproductive health is being dictated by male politicians. Freedom doesn't belong to the Republican Party, and by the way, neither does patriotism. You know, whenever I come here, I'm filled with memories of the first time I spent uh, a little visit in Columbia, which was not quite as comfortable as this one, because I was at Fort Jackson learning, even though I was a sailor, learning for some reason how to do Army stuff, because this is where they teach you how to do that. And I'm pretty sure the flag that we saluted in morning formation at O-Dark 30 or the one on my shoulder was not a Republican flag, it was an American flag. Yeah. 
symbolizing a country in which you can speak your mind, including criticizing your president, and no one will question your loyalty to the republic for which it stands. So if we want to talk about security, let's talk about security. Let's talk about cybersecurity and election security. Let's recognize that climate disruption is a national security threat. And if we want to talk about national security, let us name and confront the rising tide of violent white nationalism that has claimed lives from Charleston to San Diego. That's national security. It means economic security, and economic security felt equally, which is why I believe we need to invest in the future of black America with a Douglas plan that is as ambitious as the Marshall Plan that rebuilt Europe. We have to make these investments. And to get any of it done, we've got to insist on democracy and recognize that our democratic republic is not democratic enough. We need fair districts, we need to get money out of politics, and yes, we need to elect our president in a way where your vote and my vote counts by adding up all the votes into a national popular vote and choosing our president that way. I stand before you as an admittedly non-traditional candidate, but I think it just might do some good to send a mayor to Washington when we need Washington to look more like our best-run cities and towns instead of the other way around. And I would argue we need a new generation of leadership to step up at the highest levels in our country. We are not going to win by going on the President's show. I know it's massively entertaining. I don't know what kind of show to call it. Is it a game show? Is it a reality show? It, it's a horror show. So we're not going to go on his show, because if you're on the show, you're already losing. What are we going to do? We're going to change the channel. Running for office is an act of hope that we can make a difference. Do you have hope that we can make a difference? Are you ready to stand with me and change the channel? Then we will turn states blue from Indiana to South Carolina onto the White House and beyond, and I will be with you every step of the way. Thank you, South Carolina. Thank you. Thank you. Let's give Mayor Pete another round of applause. Now it's my pleasure to bring to the stage the Democratic Party's second vice chair, Anthony Thompson, in the caucuses. Good morning or good afternoon. I can't, I don't know what time it is today, right now. <laughs> well, how's everybody feeling? Great, great, great. I have the privilege of working with some fantastic people, some great people. Um, they are advocates for the things in our community. They are voice, they are the, the legs, the, the voice, the arms of your community, and that's our South Carolina Democratic Party caucuses. Give them a hand. So if you hadn't noticed, 
Yes, come on, Dr. Weinberg. If you hadn't noticed, there are some tables outside of this door that has um, their information. And if you're interested in one of these caucuses as I introduce them, please feel free to sign up. Uh, we really welcome your participation and involvement in what they're going to be doing. I'm going to go down the line real quick so you can see and put a name with a face so that you can know who these people are. I have on the end Bridget DeLine. She's our South Carolina, she's the Single Parents Caucus Chair. <laughs> Dr. Stuart Weinberg, he's the Environmental Caucus Chair. We have Ann Wilbrand and Jim Thompson, who are the co-chairs for the LGBTQ Caucus. We have Dwayne Sims and Mr. William Lawrence, who are the Veteran Caucus Chairs, co-chairs. We have Carlton Dallas, who is the Business Caucus Chair. We have the Miss Tangi Omama T. <laughs> Jacobs. <laughs> She's the Rural Caucus Chair. And we have John Wright, who's our Faith Caucus Chair. Now we also have, and I'm not sure, I can't see her right now, but we have, who co-chairs it with me, the Disability Caucus. And that's Peggy Butler, she's somewhere here. I thought she would have been up here, but she's somewhere. And if you're here, raise your hand, Peggy. And then we have, we have 15 total caucuses, y'all. When I started, we had nine with the party in this position, and now we have 15 active participating caucuses. So again, I'm not gonna take a lot of time because they do want to run me off the stage. But I wanna thank them so much for the work that they do. Johnny Cardero, Johnny Cardero was just up here. I thought he was running. Johnny Cardero is the chair of the Black Caucus. He was up here earlier, so give him a hand too. But thank them for the work that they do. I appreciate everything, so please be sure to sign up, see them, engage with them, talk with them, and find out more how you can get involved with those caucuses. Thank you so much, and I'll see you soon. Let's give our caucus committees and Mr. Thompson another round of applause. I will tell you that these guys are paid very well. Just kidding. <laughs> it's now my pleasure to bring to the stage the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development under President Barack Obama, Secretary Julian Castro. Please come to the stage. Buenos dias. Good morning. It is great to be here in South Carolina. With some fired up Democrats, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Senator Malloy, uh, to the convention chair, to all of the Democrats who have helped put this convention together. Congratulations on a great event and for getting 21 candidates here today. I'm Julian Castro. You know, I often feel like I need a name tag because I have a twin brother, Joaquin. My twin brother is in Congress, and he likes to say that the way to tell us apart is that I am one minute uglier than he is which is not true. I'm one minute older. You know, my brother and I grew up on the west side of San Antonio with my mother and my grandmother. And my grandmother had come over from Mexico when she was seven years old because her parents had died. She ended up working as a maid and a cook and a babysitter because she never finished elementary school. She raised my mom as a single parent. And my mother raised my brother and me as a single parent. We're proud products of the public schools of Texas. And to think that just two generations after my grandmother got to this country with nothing, one of her grandsons is serving in the United States Congress 
and the other one is running for President of the United States. That's America. I had the chance to serve as mayor of my hometown and then as Secretary of Housing and Urban Development under President Barack Obama. And during that time, I had the chance to see a hundred different communities, big and small, in our country in 39 states, to manage a $48 billion budget with 8,000 employees and 54 field offices across our country. I'm running for president because I believe that it's time for new energy and new leadership in this country with a new vision for our future. It's time for a leader that is a president for everyone, that understands that we must move forward as one nation with one destiny in the years to come. And I'm convinced that that destiny for America is to be the smartest, the healthiest, the fairest, and the most prosperous nation on Earth. If we want to be the smartest nation on Earth, we have to start early with universal pre-K for three- and four-year-olds. We have to improve K-12 through education by paying teachers what they deserve, making sure that we continue to reduce class sizes and ensure that no matter what the needs of a child are, that they can have those needs met in their school so that special needs parents don't have to feel like they have to be lawyers to argue with a bureaucracy to care for their child. If we want to be the healthiest nation on earth, we need a different healthcare system. My grandmother had type 2 diabetes, and right before she passed away, she had to have one of her feet amputated, which is common for a lot of severe diabetics. But that whole time, she had Medicare. I want to strengthen Medicare for the people who are on it and then make sure it's available to everybody who wants it. If we're going to be the fairest nation on earth, we need to reimagine and reform our justice system so that everybody is innocent until proven guilty. Sentencing reform, cash bail reform, investing in public defenders, and as I've often said, you know, recently I was in Charleston, a couple of blocks away from the Mother Emanuel AME Church, and it reminded me that four years ago, Dylan Roof went into that church and he murdered nine people while they were worshiping. And then a few hours later, he was apprehended by police without incident, as he should be, and then taken to trial and punished. But it made me think then, what about Eric Garner? and Laquan McDonald, and Stephon Clark, and Jason Perro, and what about Sandra Bland, and what about Pamela Turner, and what about Antonio Arce, and what about Walter Scott here in South Carolina? They deserve justice too. No matter who you are, no matter what you look like, no matter the color of your skin, you ought to be treated the same under our justice system, and we can help bring that about. I'm the only candidate that has put forward a plan on police reform. We won't have any second-class citizens when I'm President of the United States. If we're going to be the most prosperous nation on Earth, it means prosperity for everybody. We need to raise the minimum wage. We need to ensure that we build up our labor unions because labor unions have been a ticket to the middle class. We also need to do things that we should have done a long time ago, like pass the Equal Rights Amendment and the Equality Act, and also invest in affordable housing, because the rent is going through the roof in too many communities, not only the big cities, but even the smaller towns. And, you know, a few weeks ago, somebody asked me, what's the first thing that you would do if you're elected president? And I told him the first thing that I would do when I'm in office is that I would sign an executive order recommitting the United States to the Paris Climate Accord so that we lead again on sustainability and then follow that up with investment to get to net zero and create more jobs in the new energy economy. But, but I also told them that, you know, my favorite moment of that day would actually come a little bit earlier, the moment when it's traditional on the White House lawn for the incoming president to usher out the, in, the outgoing president I can just imagine being there with my wife Erica and our daughter Karina and my son Christian 
getting ready to usher off Donald Trump and Melania Trump. They'll be getting ready to go to New York or to Mar-a-Lago or somewhere. The helicopter will be out in the distance. And just before he walks away, just as he's about to go, I'm going to tell him, adios. Thank you all very much. Thank you, South Carolina. Let's go make change in 2020. We're counting on you. Gracias. Thank you. It's me again. So we have had the fortunate opportunity to hear from some exciting candidates this morning. I've got some, just some notes and housekeeping business. Uh, we're eventually, we've got two more presidential candidates from which we will hear before we take a small break for lunch. Uh, for those of you who purchased a box lunch, you can get that under uh, the escalator. Uh, those of you who have purchased the seated lunch, we will hear from our U.S. Senate candidates at that time. And I just wanted to make sure that we were very clear on that. I wanted to give you an overview of the, the afternoon, and you will hear this again. Immediately after lunch, we will hear from Senator Sanders. We will hear from a lot of candidates. So my point to you is, is that we knew this was going to be a long day. It is the price we pay for having all of these people wanting to see you. So what we need to make sure is this, that when we break for lunch, we need you to be back here at 10 minutes until 1 o'clock so that we can hear from the next candidate. We want to be as courteous and give every candidate the genuine attention that only South Carolina can give to those candidates. And so we're going to need to do that when we break for lunch. I'm going to now turn it over to our convention chair who will introduce our next guest. Thank you. Um, you guys enjoying the presidential candidates? I want to thank you for being orderly and the fact that we are continuing to be on, on time. Um, our next speaker is the senator from Minnesota, Senator Amy Klobuchar. Please welcome her to the stage. Hello, South Carolina. It is so great to be back here, and I have a good feeling about this state because the last time that I spoke at your dinner, something really big happened. 
It was the year we elected Barack Obama as President of the United States. So many of you may have seen my announcement in a very non-South Carolina blizzard. Uh, you know what happened after that announcement? The President actually sent out a tweet. He made fun of me for talking about climate change in the middle of a blizzard, and he called me Snow Woman. So I wrote back, hey, Donald Trump, the science is on my side, and I'd like to see how your hair would fare in a blizzard. <laughs> so I announced in that blizzard, I didn't take it inside, because I wanted to make the point that I don't come from money, and I have grit. And I got into politics for a good reason. It's when our daughter was born, she couldn't swallow, she was in for tests, she was in intensive care, and back then the insurance companies had a rule, and they pushed me out of the hospital after only 24 hours. Well, as a mom with no elected office, I went to the legislature and I passed one of the first laws in the country guaranteeing new moms and their babies a 48-hour hospital stay. That's how I do my work. My background, it's a little different than Donald Trump. My grandpa worked 1,500 feet underground in the mines. He never graduated from high school, but he saved money in a coffee can to send my dad to college. My dad got a two-year community college degree. My mom, she came from Milwaukee. She was a teacher. She taught second grade until she was 70 years old. And South Carolina Democrats, she was a proud union member. And I stand before you today as a granddaughter of an iron ore miner, as a daughter of a teacher and a newspaper man, as a first woman elected to the United States Senate from the state of Minnesota, and a candidate for president of the United States. That is what this country is all about, that no matter where you come from, no matter who you know, no matter what you look like, no matter where you pray, no matter who you love, that you can make it in the United States of America. Why? Because we live in a country of shared dreams. And we have a president that tries to fracture those dreams every single day. He wakes up every morning sending out tweets going after immigrants, sending out tweets going after people of color, anyone that doesn't agree to him. And I say this. We need to tear down the barriers of success. We need to stop those mean tweets and that divide. We need to cross the river our divides to a higher plane in our politics and give everyone in this country a seat at the table. We need an America, an America that's as good as the heart and the strength of the people of South Carolina. We need an optimistic economic agenda that works in the East and the West and the North and the South, because we are not going to leave the South behind in this election. We have to make sure that people in our urban areas understand that food doesn't magically appear on your table. And this means investing in infrastructure in urban and rural America. It means broadband, childcare, fair housing, getting our education system back on track, and supporting public education and our teachers, and closing the opportunity gap right here in South Carolina. If billionaires can refinance their yachts, then students should be able to refinance their student loans. And as president, I will stand with Congressman Clyburn and the work he has done on poverty and cut child poverty in half in 10 years and end child poverty in a generation. We can do this, Democrats. This means protecting our water, protecting South Carolina's shores from offshore drilling. This means protecting our climate. And the people are on the side of me you and Joe Cunningham when it comes to the science of climate change. That's why on day one, I will sign us back into the International Climate Change Agreement. This means universal health care, rural hospital, and it means taking on those pharmaceutical companies to bring down the prices. They think they own Washington. Well, they don't own me. It means taking on the NRA and the dark money. It means 
restoring our voting rights so that if that hadn't happened in Georgia, where they withheld 58,000 ballots, we would have had a governor in Georgia named Stacey Abrams. And we still can with voting rights. It means passing a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United and passing my bill to register kids. But to do this, we're going to need to win. I got a plan for our first 100 days, over 100 things you could do without Mitch McConnell, without the Republicans. And I run my campaigns with one simple idea. That is, you leave no one behind. And I have gone to every single county in my state every year, the reddest of counties. And you know what happens when you do that? Where you meet people where they are? I have won every single congressional district every time I have run. Every place. Places that Donald Trump won by 20 points. I have won every race, every place, everywhere, every time. And this is going to mean the kind of race we run in this country. And this is going to mean you, South Carolina Democrat. So this is the arc that we are on. The day after the inauguration, millions of people marched across this country, right? On day nine, they marched against that mean-spirited refugee order. On day one, on day 100, they marched for science. My favorite sign, what do we want science? When do we want it? After peer review. On day 292, we won elections all over in those legislative districts we never thought we would win. And in a victory of decency and dignity, on day 327, Doug Jones won in the state of Alabama. Then you go to the fall when Joe Cunningham won in 2018 and you turned the House of Representatives back into the people's house. That is the arc we are on, and that is the march for justice that are going to bring us to victory in 2020. Let's go do it. Let's win. I'd love your support. I know how to win. Let's get this done. Thank you. All right, how we doing? Let's give Senator Klobuchar another round of applause. She told us that it was a little warmer here than it was in Minnesota because of you. So this afternoon, we're going to have a break here in a little bit. But this afternoon, please know that we got to carry on the business of the convention. We'll have our proposed rule changes. We have our report of platform and resolutions. We have our election of vice chairs. And we have a number of candidates still left to end up speaking. Um, we have at least, um, let's see, Senator um, Kildebrand, Andrew Yang, um, Bernie Sanders, Joe Biden. We have many others that are going to be here. So we want to make sure that we have a, we're going to have a long day. I may miss some, some names. Um, whenever I say it, we want everybody to give them as much attention as we can. But before I go any further, um, there's a young man over here that, that has a phone next to his um, ear, Mr. Will Alexander, that planned all of this convention. He's shaking his head. He doesn't want any credit for it. They're turning him. Look how young he is. He's the future of our party. Can you believe last night we had the dinner in this very same room. And they broke it down, and we had it here today. I'd like to thank those members that are over there that's running around. It seems like it's a little hairy scary, but they're very organized, and they've done a terrific job. At the same time, it's too many of the, our law enforcement to end up thanking for what they have done. But obviously, they have made it safe for us around here. You see them standing around the room. Let's give all our law enforcement personnel a big round of applause for working 
taking care of us here on this day. And I have a young man that's been walking around with me saying, you know, Dad, you're supposed to be the referee. They're not supposed to see you. You got to see other people so you don't talk too much. My son Donovan, who just graduated from law school, is making sure that we keep everything on track. And Trav will not be still. <laughs> he is running around, and we got lots of other speakers that end up coming before you. So um, I think that we're almost getting close to lunch. We got maybe a couple more speakers beforehand, and then one surprise speaker, and then we'll be, we'll be breaking. And so I'm ready for our um, next um, speaker. And so without further ado, I'd like to welcome to the stage Ms. Marianne Williamson, author, businesswoman, and activist, Let's give her a round of applause. This is Mary Ann Williams. to be here. I want to thank Congressman Clyburn for that fantastic fish fry last night. And I also want all of us to wish Elizabeth Warren happy birthday. <clears throat> I want to get right into it with you so you'll know why I'm here. The United States government is deeply corrupt. This is not a swamp. This is a sea of corruption. This has been going on for 40 years, and we're now, to, now at a point where basically we are not functioning as a democracy. We're functioning as a veiled aristocracy, the same kind of thing we said no to in 1776, the same kind of thing that showed and reared its ugly head with slavery, that shows and rears its ugly head with the suppression of women, that shows and rears its ugly head with segregation, with white supremacy, with Islamophobia, with anti-LBGTQ, with anti-Semitism. And that ugliness is back. And it's back not so much in terms of one particular institution. That would be like an operable tumor that we could just excise. Rather, ladies and gentlemen, it's really sly now. It's back as a mindset. And it is like a cancer that has metastasized, and we have a president that has harnessed it for political purposes. <clears throat> this is not something that we can defeat with just traditional policy prescription. I have great respect for all of the people who are running. I agree pretty much with what everybody says. We know what the Democrats stand for. But ladies and gentlemen, we need to be honest with ourselves and go deep about what's going to happen in 2020. The truth of the matter is Donald Trump did not win and he will not win re-election if only the powerfully passionate Trump supporters voted for him and vote for him again. Donald Trump won, and if he is re-elected, he will win again because of all the people who should be with us stay home again. <clears throat> we need to do more than fight. Enough is enough with how we're going to We can't stand Donald Trump, Donald Trump so bad. Who among us doesn't like get that already? And the people who are going to vote for Democrat don't need to be told that. What we need to do is inspire some people who don't feel that sure that the Democrats are any better. And that's because they're not sure the Democrats any, are any better, even though we know that the Democrats are totally better, because too often, although the Republicans don't walk their talk, the Democrats are not that good sometimes at talking their walk. <clears throat> sometimes I say things that are really getting down, because that's what needs to happen. The only thing that can defeat big lies, ladies and gentlemen, is some big truth. So the Democratic Party needs to talk some big truth. The Democratic Party has to get down and be real. We have to be radical truth tellers and we need to inspire hearts because Donald Trump is not just dealing with policy prescriptions. For decades now, Democratic Congress people, Democratic senators, Democratic governors have said to me, Marianne, I don't understand it. We had him on the issues. Why didn't I win? And all the time I'm always saying, the part of the brain that analyzes an issue is not the part of the brain that decides who to vote for. 
And so it's not enough to just have good policies. We had good policies last time, and we lost. We need more than good policies. We need to get down. We need to talk about how dirty, how corrupt, how rotten this whole thing has become, and admit to ourselves so the American people can feel it that too often the Democrats have conspired. We need to get down and talk about those 40% those of all Americans who have a rough time just making it every day. We have to show that we care, and I've been out there for 35 years. I do care. I have had a 35-year career being up close and personal with the sea of human suffering that is a result of bad public policy. The Democratic Party has too often been moral equivocators. We must morally equivocate no longer. There are millions of American children who go to schools in schools that do not even have functioning toilets. Millions of American children who go to schools in schools that don't even have adequate school supplies with which to teach a child to read. If they can't learn to read by the age of eight, they have a drastically reduced chance of, of graduation and a drastically increased chance of incarceration. The political establishment has just normalized their despair. We should be rescuing these children no differently than if they were the victims of a natural disaster. I want the real thing, ladies and gentlemen, not just superficial things. I want a Department of Children and Youth. I want a massive realignment of investment in the direction of our children under 10. I don't want to just talk about Medicare for all, although we need it. We need to talk about the chemical policies and the environmental policies and the food policies and the agricultural policies that are making us so sick. And I don't just want to talk about race-based policies, because if you just talk about race-based policies, you're leaving open the question of whose fault that is. We need reparations, and we need need reparations because reparations do more than pay money. They are spiritual power. They are an inherent mea culpa. They are an acknowledgement of a wrong that has been done, a debt that is owed, and a willingness to pay it. And in addition to that, ladies and gentlemen, we need to do more than just endlessly prepare for war. And we need to do more than just say things like, we need to bring the boys home. We need to challenge the underlying forces that make all this darkness inevitable. We need to challenge the military industrial complex. We need to talk about war as too big business. We need a department of peace. We need to treat all desperate people as a national security risk. The Democrats need to get real, ladies and gentlemen, or they will not win in 2020. That's what I've been doing for 35 years, radical truth and inspirer of hearts. Thank you very, very, very much. Thank you. We're almost, almost to break for lunch, but uh, first, let's give Miss Marianne Williams an, another round of applause. So as chair, they've allowed me to have a little bit of discretion, so I want to bring to the stage someone that we hold very dear. But before I do it, I have to tell you that Professor West is here in the house. If he raises his hand over there, can't see him. Okay, and so now we have a person that was also a presidential candidate at one time. He told me that he went to jail in 1960 and never stopped fighting. He won South Carolina in 1984, 1988, was a presidential candidate. And he tells us this, keep hope alive. Let's welcome to the stage Reverend Jesse Jackson. Let me express my sincere thanks for being received so well at home. I want to express my thanks to Jim and Emily Clyburn. Emily has been sick for a while. In the hospital earlier this week, she is now home resting. So because of her work and the party, and Jim in the real sense as our host, we owe a special debt to Jim Clyburn. On your feet for Jim Clyburn. Put your hands together for Jim Clyburn. Put your hands together for Jim Clyburn.
this is home. I grew up in Greenville, South Carolina. <laughs> Traveled the state playing Sanders and Lawrence and Bryson and Fountain Inn and Brewer and Greenwood and C. Johnson and Booker Washington in Columbia. <laughs> Howard and Georgetown, Burke and Charleston. This is home. Share some information with your first five seven words. Unregistered black voters in 10 top counties. Richland, 38,600. Charleston, 24,000. Greenville, 18,000. Orangeburg, 12,000. Spunberg, 13,000. Florence, 12,000. Sumter, 11,000. Berkeley, 10,000. York, 10,000. No one has the right to win if you do less than 10. No one, if you no one has the right to win if you do less than their best. When we do our best, good things come our way. In the real sense, I want to welcome you today to the, to the New South. I did go to jail in 1960, trying to use a public library in Greenville, South Carolina. We can change so much for the New South. We cannot go back. When the walls come down, we see the beauty of the South. Because the walls are down today, you can see number one state in tire production, Bridgestone and Continental. Because the walls are down, you see Carolina Panthers and Atlanta Falcons. Because the walls are down, Clemson is number one in the nation, football. The walls come down, good things come my way. Yesterday I opened up when I came here by going out to the, to the jail, looking at children in the jail, 80% African American. That's what you do, I, I sit there all day, we play cards, we play checkers. What do you do all day? We read, we watch television. Those in jail who are nonviolent should be at home on an anchor bracelet. Those in jail should have, com they should have computers, should learn how to do apps and codes while they're in jail and use that time to come out and get a job and don't go back. This is the New South. We cannot let Trump take us backwards. Number one. Number two, we have survived apart. They must learn to live together. We didn't know how good baseball could be until everybody could play. So we didn't know, so we didn't know how good baseball could be, a football, that everybody could play. We don't know how good politics can be in our state until everybody can function together. South Carolina, is too blue to be red. A blue state shouldn't have red politics. 250,000 folk in this state have no Medicaid. Women with breasts hurting, take an Advil rather than get a mammogram. Because they turned down affordable care trying to avoid Obamacare. They were misled by Graham and Trump. How can a state turn back $9 billion in health care? In Bamberg, South Carolina, where Nikki Haley was born, hospital is closed. You must leave Bamberg to the Orangeburg 60 miles if you have a broken ankle. We must fight for affordable health care for every American. There is no such thing as a bump. There is no such thing as a bummer care. There's no such thing as Obamacare. There is affordable health care. They turn people against him and put his face. I, I say, if I want affordable health care, don't want Obamacare, I want omelet, but don't want the eggs. New South Carolina. New Day, 
We must move from racial battleground to economic common ground, the moral higher ground. What's common ground for us? We all want the, the richness of our state. You know, I watched Memorial Day services being celebrated last week in Washington. First Memorial Day was in Charleston, South Carolina. Civil War was over in 1865. 300 the Union soldiers would come south to save the Union and end slavery, put in the racetrack in Charleston. They perished in the racetrack when they were rotted in their death. Put them in the racetrack behind, uh, a modest grave behind the race. When blacks got free, they took them out the graves and gave them individual graveyards for dignity. They marched around the racetrack in Charleston to memorialize those that come south. South Carolina is a state of, of rich history. But it's rich as still. We are going to win South Carolina in 2020. We have the need, see we have the need and the power. What makes us common? Protective, protected right to vote, affordable health care, liberal wages, Eliminate student loan debt, invest in America, stop foolish wars, have a high moral standard. It is disgraceful to abort the babies on the border in Texas. We abort the babies on, on the border in Charleston some years ago, and they sold those babies. Jesus was aboard the baby. Went to Egypt as an immigrant and became a ref refugee. Be careful how you treat border babies. Let nothing break your spirit, South Carolina. This is a great day to be alive. Say, this is a great day to be alive. It's dark, but the morning comes. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Years of I walk through valleys and shadows of death. I fear no evil. But thou art with me. Though you slay me, yet will I trust you. It's healing time. If my people will call by my name, humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from the wicked, then they will hear from heaven and say, God will heal our land. God will heal our land. God will heal our land. Victory is assured. Come 2020. God bless you. you. Give Reverend Jackson a round of applause. We, um, we will now have lunch. Um, so what we're going to do is please be back by 1 o'clock. The next presidential candidate will come on the stage promptly right at around 1 o'clock. So we'd like to have you in our seats because we can end up starting right away. So we are recessed for lunch. Thank you.